It has been five months. It has been five months since the first case of COVID-19 in America. Can you believe it? Five months. We're going to focus on two categories coming out of the weekend. Just to catch you up as you start off on this Monday, the pandemic and the president and a lot of different news in between. So let's start off first with the pandemic. Five months in COVID-19 in America, and here's where we're at today. We have nearly half of U.S. states reporting a rise in COVID-19 cases. And what we're really watching is infection rates. So we're seeing a rise in infection rates. We're also watching hospitalizations. We're seeing an increase in hospitalization, and that's one of the things that health officials are really paying close attention to because that signifies a more serious case. The New York Times was reporting that deaths overall due to COVID-19 are down, but I want you to be a little bit wary of a fact like that because we know that deaths follow infections by about three to four weeks. So that's gonna be a really important stat to watch as we move ahead over the next month. Where are the infections going up? We're seeing it in the South. We're seeing it in the Midwest and we're seeing it in the West. So that only leaves out the East Coast. But we know that the East Coast had a big spike initially with the outbreak. And so we're continuing to watch what's happening in the East Coast in a reopening that's occurring there. And America's largest city in New York, we're seeing that folks are being allowed to go back to work. So it's going to be important to watch what cases look like also in the East Coast as we sort of go through the next four weeks. One of the things I was thinking about uh, as we've been reporting over the last several months is we used to talk a lot about models, right? The models, what are they gonna be predicting? And I was reminded that when we first were looking at the models about what the summer was going to look at, the models were really only showing us until August. And we, we understand now that the models are really changing you know, day to day. So I'm gonna take another look at the models to see what the predictive nature is, but we also know not to put a, a ton of stake in it, at least at least right now. So I'll be curious to hear from you what it looks like in your area. We're seeing more uh, communities require mask wearing as a way to prevent some of these infections. There is a story out of the LA Times that caught my attention. I'm gonna to link to it on our website. I want you to take a look at it when you have a spare moment. I think it's a good read. It was talking about the challenges of uh, tracking COVID-19, but specifically in the state of California, there has been concerns by health officials there that COVID-19 was present far before they realized, and specifically tied to deaths. What I thought was interesting in this article is that there are a few deaths of young people um, where their families are now skeptical, wondering, was that COVID? And it's difficult to go back and trace your steps and test. And in certain areas, like in Washington State, for example, if the medical examiner is involved, oftentimes someone will be tested post-mortem for COVID-19. But that's not happening everywhere. And another part of this article was a discussion about children and pediatricians seeing some cases that, that caused them concern in a, a early January, late December, and now wondering again, was that COVID? You know, and, and obviously it's very difficult to know right now. Uh, in some cases, there is tissue available. For example, one of these uh, young men who died, he was an organ donor. So they are able to, to submit to the CDC and see if there's something more to these cases, but it's not easy to do. And so that raises a larger question overall. Why does this matter? Well, how much can we really rely on the testing? How good really is the testing still? Yes, we're seeing infection rates go up, but what is that really telling us? How much stake can we put into that? In addition to this, you're seeing in states like Florida, Disney announced that they're going to go through a staggered opening, despite the fact that we are seeing rising infection rates there. And so we'll be watching how different states handle this moving forward. Florida is an interesting state because the president, not only is it a state that some are pointing to as perhaps the next state to really watch when it comes to COVID-19 outbreaks, but it's also where the president is scheduled to hold uh, a convention. The Republican National Party is scheduled to hold the convention in late August. And of course, one of the big news items this weekend was the president's first campaign rally in a really long time. Now, I just want to be clear about something. I don't chase every campaign event. <laughs> we can't. We're not going to be able to do that. I did sit down and watch this on Saturday night. 
because it was the president's first campaign event really over the last several months. We know so much news has transpired from the pandemic to civil unrest, uh, to protests, to racial tension. So I really wanted to pay close attention. What is the president going to talk about? What is the tone that he's going to set? It was no newsworthy in, in my mind for several different reasons. And so I, I, I did watch the hour and 45 minute event on Saturday. I hope you were doing something else because I was doing it for you. Um, the one thing I will say is this was very reminiscent of previous rallies, you know, a similar atmosphere, a similar tone by the president. I know there's a lot of news being made about the crowd size. And I look at the crowd size as something important. We're watching enthusiasm for different politicians. That's critical. But we had to be careful about making too big of a deal over one event. Yes, the crowd size was lower than expected. The campaign talked about that as well. Um, there's a lot going on in the world, and I think one of the reasons why I led this conversation with it's been five months since COVID-19 started in America, I think we could recall, agree that we're in a really different world than we are than we were, you know, five months ago. So, again, I. If if it's it's if it's a half dozen events where the crowd is smaller than expected, I think then we do a larger story on it. You should know that it's 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 smaller than expected, but I don't want to make too big of a deal about it. It's sort of like polling. I, I watch it, but you know, it's only capturing one single moment in time. Here's what the president said. This one line I think sums up the argument by the president for his reelection. Essentially, he was saying if Joe Biden wins, if the Democrats win, the left will launch a full scale assault on American life. And this is what he spent a lot of time talking about, saying, listen, if the Democrats come into control, you're going to see anarchy on the streets, you're going to see a threat to your gun rights, your 401k, your taxes are going to be up. Um, this is what this is the argument that the president made on Saturday night. We'll see how it resonated. What are we going to be watching? We're going to be watching suburban white women. We're going to be watching minority. We're going to be watching independent. These are the categories we're going to be watching because these three categories, regardless of what happens in Tulsa or anywhere else, these are the three categories that were really the voters to watch in 2016 that helped the president secure his victory. So how will these messages resonate with this group? A lot of you asked about Seattle, and the president uh, mentioned Seattle as well in his speech. Uh, one thing you should know about Seattle, and we're going to have more on this website later, I'll link to it for you, is that obviously there's a big area of Seattle where there is what's being described as a protest community taking place, something that many of us have never seen before. In Seattle over the weekend, there were two separate shootings. In the first shooting on Saturday night in this zone, police could not get to the victims because the police were being attacked. I just read that there was another shooting late on Sunday night. We're just getting news about that. So this is an area where we are seeing an increase in violence. This is something that the president was talking about, continuing to try to position himself as a law and order president. We'll see if that's effective. In the meantime, Vice President Joe Biden continues to try to do his virtual events. We got some news over the weekend that it seems that the vice president was able to outraise President Trump when it comes to fundraising. We know how crucial money is uh, in the month of May. However, when you look at the president's, so what they call the war chest, the, the Republican Party is still outraising the Democrats. That's not necessarily surprising because the Democrats only just finalized their candidate. So again, we'll watch where the money goes. The money also tells us a story. In the meantime, the president is going to be traveling to Arizona and Wisconsin. Uh, the vice president is also going to be focusing on Wisconsin. These are swing states and also very critical. Um, okay. I have to tell you this funny story that happens during the speech, though, and I'm telling this because I hope it's helpful to you. For, during the president's rally, like I said, I haven't I haven't watched any of these in a really long time. Uh, my husband was helping put the kids to bed as I was watching this rally, and I was cleaning the dishes while I was doing it. My son comes in to get a glass of water before he goes to bed, and as the president's speaking, the president uses a bad word. And I forgot about this, that the president sometimes does this. So I'm actually sharing this with you as kind of a warning in case you have family around and you watch any of these events. And of course, I go into this long explanation with my five-year-old about how a man's word is, ever, I mean, I go way off the deep end <laughs> trying to say, don't listen to the president about using foul language. And my son looks at me, he goes, mom, it's okay. He's been stuck indoors a long time, just like the rest of us. And he just walks out of the kitchen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know if my five-year-old has some wisdom. I hope he doesn't repeat that language. 
either way, I think uh, I think that kind of ties our two big news stories together, the pandemic and the president, and yes, they are related. Here's my one question for you. What is the one thing you want to hear from a candidate for president? What's the one thing that can really speak to your soul right now? Whoever it is, what just whatever came to your gut, put it in the comment section below. I'm really curious what the priority is for you. Is it learning more about the pandemic? Is it civil unrest? Is it national security? What is it that's really resonating with you as it stands right now in June? And what are you looking for more from presidential candidates, whether it's President Trump or Vice President Biden? I'm really curious to hear it. All right, guys, we got a lot of work to do. I'm gonna, uh, again, update our website, make sure to get a couple other little news nuggets on there for you. Keep your comments coming because we like to find out what you're interested in and of course, deliver it to you. Have a great Monday, have a great start to your week, and I'll see you later on smarternews.com. Have a great day, guys.